Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, I am the Crypto Crow and welcome. This video, if it's not one of the most eye-opening videos you've seen in quite some time, I'll be shocked. And I will also preface this video by saying that I did have a chat with Charles Hoskinson uh, fairly recently. And what I show you in this video, he did in fact give me permission to share with you because I asked him. I often have discussions with people in private and I don't air anything publicly that's not meant for public consumption. I'm not a clout chaser and I'm not looking to pin any up, anyone up based off of the, their opinion of the day. So that's not my way. And I did ask Charles for permission to share with you what I'm going to be sharing with you as well as a lot of information relating to the topic that will support why uh, I believe Charles feels the way he does. I also wanna say this, don't ever assume to know what I think or feel on a particular topic based off of what I say on YouTube. That's really all I can tell you with that. Uh, and I will leave it at that. So we're gonna get started. We're gonna start on this video by watching a, a video clip. And um, and then I am going to, well, you know what? I'm just gonna show you the, 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 the chat image real quick first before we dive into this. So this is, this is a, a little chat. This is from December 2nd. And I, and I asked Charles and I said, I'm gonna have to pull this down so that I can actually read it because it's so small. Uh, I will zoom out and in as needed. Um, and you can see this is Charles. And, and we've had an ongoing relationship for years talking, you know, mostly briefly about a lot of different things related to Cardano. Often when I approach somebody, I always try to approach people with a very 50-50 kind of presentation of what I'm asking, if that makes sense. In other words, I never basically blatantly say, I'm yay, I'm nay, I'm yes, I'm no, I'm this or that. I always try to leave it very neutral territory because I want people to tell me what they truly think. And I often try to make people feel very comfortable because it is safe to talk to me. It is very safe to talk to me, regardless of what your beliefs are. I am very much one that all opinions matter, I don't have to agree with you to like you. I have long-winded arguments with people that I blatantly disagree with and often think are kind of delusional and crazy, but I still love them all the same because differences of opinion are what make the world go round. So there you have it. So my question to him was very simple. Am I wrong to believe that Cardano is being built to facilitate the current and coming changes related to the World Economic Forum, ESG, et cetera? as you mentioned on Twitter, or somehow building against it. I would love to dive into the topic in an interview. As a Freemason myself, as I have been for decades, and most of you guys know that already, and someone that has been researching these agendas for decades, watching it all come to fruition, it's scary, but somehow exciting. I believe the pandemic and climate change are both fabrications personally used to usher in these dramatic efforts to change the world for the fourth industrial revolution. But I've been trying to figure out what Cardano's role might be in all of it. Can you build anything like this without these coming changes in mind and find success on a grand scale? Or do you lean into it? I'd love to know your thoughts. His response, I built Cardano to fight them. If they win, it's the end of humanity. We'll all be slaves. This is from someone I consider to be extremely brilliant, very well informed, very much someone that is capable, well-funded, uh, you name it, any, anything you wanna say. Some people could call him, uh, you know, uh, I mean, anything, right? There's a narrative, there are multiple narratives for each and every one of us and how we uh, are and how we handle things. But he was very clear in his stance on this. And not only do I greatly appreciate him sharing that with me, I greatly appreciate him giving me the permission to, to use this and to show everyone. Because I think that the, the claims are bold. Now I'm going to start showing you some things uh, that I think you will make it easier for you to understand why he says this, 
what his stance is, why his stance is the way it is, and hopefully it will open your eyes to uh, 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 to some degree what I believe is going on. And then we're gonna get into why I believe and how Cardano to some degree is being built to facilitate an objection to this grand narrative that we've been seeing unfold since 2020. Here we go. My favorite economic forum speaker of all time is this reptile. Klaus Schwab's top advisor, Dr. Yuval Noah Harari. Let's see what he has to say. Data might enable human elites to do something even more radical than just build digital dictatorships. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Elites hacking organisms and re-engineering life itself? Well, he's not talking about doing that to people, is he? Now, in the past, many tyrants and governments wanted to do it, but nobody understood biology well enough, and nobody had enough computing power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo nor the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will be able to systematically hack all the people. Well, I guess he was talking about doing that to people, all people to be specific. So that's just a, a part of the clip. I'm gonna finish the whole thing. It, because basically what this video is, is a, it's a, it's a small collage of statements made. And then there are, there's an article that I'm gonna share that also quotes several elements of various books by this gentleman. And when you take into account that this man's perspective on what is happening and what is to come is also in the ear of Klaus Schwab, basically the, the founder, or the, the, the front runner for the World Economic Forum, a group by which an endlessly growing number of, of world leaders, CEOs, uh, board members in all things politics on a global level, the media, science and technology and so forth and so on. I call it the great think tank because it, there are a lot of brilliant people, let's not lie. Uh, but it also establishes this grand narrative that is ultimately, to put this into perspective, there's a video that I watched, uh, it was a documentary, uh, it's been a couple of years on Netflix about a, a um, kind of a Christian organization that infiltrated uh, the political regimes all over the place I can't even remember what it's called. Some of you may remember when, when by, just by me triggering your memory with the statements, but uh, they were very much about instituting a kind of a political agenda or a religious agenda through politics. And it was wildly successful for quite some time. Some argue may still be in effect, but now we have something else that kind of, I would suggest is the polar opposite of that group because this is all about the fourth industrial revolution and where technology is going to take us and transhumanism and uh and more we're going to get into it but we'll finish this clip specific and if indeed we succeed in hacking and engineering life this will be not just the greatest revolution in the history of humanity this will be the greatest revolution in biology since the very beginning of life four billion years ago for four billion years, nothing fundamental changed. Not playing God, are you? Because that usually works out super well. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some God above the clouds. Oh, you are playing God. Say more. But our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. Gosh, you wouldn't by chance have a plan in place on how to control people with your cloud technology, would you? And that plan isn't by chance already being implemented, is it? Today, we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. Oh, so you could implement it. In this time of crisis, you have to follow science. It's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste. People could look back in a hundred years and identify the coronavirus epidemic as the moment when a new regime of surveillance took over, especially surveillance under the skin. Humans are now hackable animals. 
you know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. Free will, that's over. So, there you have some of that. Uh, there's a lot said in those clips. <laughs> and like I told Charles, it's exciting, but scary. Because what does it mean exactly? And how do they plan on, on, on bringing a lot of this to fruition on a global scale? And why? Why do they feel it's necessary to even have these types of, of options available to them? And there is this, this rabbit hole goes so deep, okay? And while many would come across information like this and think, because ultimately you're programmed. I mean, generally the, the, the general public is ultimately being programmed and has been programmed for some time to just cast away a lot of this stuff as bogus theory and um, nonsense and, and comedy to some, but it's very real. And it's a very difficult idea to grasp based off of where we've where we started as a society, where we've started uh, technologically. I mean, the Model T Ford, the first car, wasn't very long ago, and now we're going out to outer space. You, you know, the the transition from era to era uh, in these industrial revolutions and what they ultimately mean on a grander scale. You know, I've always been to some degree kind of on the fence about a lot of it because it's not necessarily the end goal uh, to some degree that scares me, but how we manage to get there, how we see ourselves getting there. I'm somebody that if I had the opportunity, I would go travel the intergalactic space webs uh, and, and, and just like have a field day exploring and meeting new life. I would, I would literally live the life of Star Trek, right? I would be all about that. I couldn't even fathom the idea of that being a possibility. We might be getting there. But the question is, is do we go there at, on the Starship Enterprise or do we go as a Borg cube? That's the question I don't know. And that is what is ultimately scary to me while at the same time somewhat exciting. But if what I am witnessing and what I am seeing and what I'm reading and what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you like bits of some of this stuff. It's really gonna be up to you to dive deeper. Uh, but these are other quotes um, from Yuval uh, and and they're, they're quite interesting. Uh, on decision-making. Humans think about life as a drama full of decision-making. What will be the meaning of human life if most decisions are talking by algorithms, are, are taken by algorithms? Basically saying that when, when computers and artificial intelligence is able to make the majority of our decisions for us, what is life at that point? Um, because there's no meaning. And ultimately, there's there are no mistakes or rewards to be had because everything is done for us. That's also a scary thought because that also eliminates free will. And what is free will? And this goes into a whole uh, stratosphere of, of questions. You won't go to the movies. You'll download the movie into your brain via devices like Elon Musk's Neuralink. Will we even download movies at that point or will we be the movie? You know, if you think about virtual reality and, and metaverses and all of that, as I've discussed many times on this channel, that what is the line between entering a metaverse and being a metaverse? Uh, and, and where does this technology take us moving forward? On peace, since 1945, not a single internationally recognized country was wiped off the map by external invasion. This is a fantastic achievement, which is the basis for everything we have for our medical services, for education system, and this is all now in jeopardy. Because of this era of peace, it wasn't a result of some miracle. It wasn't a result of the change in the laws of nature. It is humans making better decisions and building better institutions, okay? Applications for your life. Uh, every decision you make is like a stone that falls into a lake and generates ripples. It's up to you whether those ripples are harmony, producing virtuous cycles, or of destruction filling your life with chaos. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, to some degree, that's very true. If the advice we get from Amazon, Google, or Facebook is better than the advice we get from our feelings, we will trust the algorithms of these companies more than our own feelings. But will we though? Because right now we're seeing a society that is ultimately triggered and, and perpetuated by feelings. It's not necessarily facts. It's not science, really. It's not anything ultimately real, any less or any more real than one's own intuitive response to the world around them. So right now we're seeing so many decisions being made on emotional triggers, perceptions of one's reality, perceptions of one's personality uh, from the outside looking in. And we're basing very, very dramatic and drastic uh, changes uh, based off of that that perception. And, and we all know perception is reality. And so the idea is creating uh, a perception or creating a narrative ultimately defines one's reality, who's locked into it. We're seeing that time and time again. We're seeing it on a daily basis, how our, 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 our very reality is subject to the, the narration of the news media and of anyone that's basically a part of or towing a particular line. And, and that is absolutely scary because, you know, at what point do we go back to the facts? At what point, or, or is there a point? Are we beyond that at this point? Are we getting so far out in the left field that real data just no longer matters? So there are a lot of, there's a lot of information about this gentleman out there, okay? And, you know, a lot of this goes into topics that I brought in the, brought up in the past, the internet of bodies, the internet of things, how these two will likely become one or married in a kind of an in, in interoperable solution for navigating the world around us, uh, using our own bodies and the technology that's related to perpetuating this kind of stuff. And we're gonna go into that a little bit. Have you heard the term of internet of bodies or IOB? That may conjure up a few thoughts that have nothing to do with the true nature of the term, but it's about using the human body as the latest data platform. The internet of bodies is an extension of the IOT or internet of things and basically connects the human body to a network through devices that are ingested, implanted, or connected. Notice the one other way that it doesn't mention in this. <laughs> I guess we'll just call that ingested. To the body in some way. Once connected, data can be exchanged in the body and device can be remotely monitored and controlled. Obviously, this is a technology still yet to be perfected. Uh, and then it goes into the different ways that that this kind of technology can be ushered in. All the links that I'm that I'm going to have, I'm going to have available on my soblocks.com profile. I'm not going to put all these links here, just so you know. Now, this is the World Economic Forum's website, tracking how our bodies work could change our lives. For whatever reason, we need to know absolutely every little nuance of everything. I'm guessing. A really good way to establish a truly effective narrative, especially if we were to maintain any form of political system, is to better understand the emotional triggers that make people react or respond in a way that's more, oh, what's the way, what's the predictable, I guess is, the, is probably a good term. Pretty soon they're going to be able to do that. If they can't already, I don't know. We've entered the era of the Internet of Bodies. Now, this is the World Economic Forum saying we've entered the era of, of the Internet of Bodies. Collecting our physical data via, via a range of devices that can be implanted, swallowed, or worn. The result is a huge amount of health-related data that can improve human well-being around the world and prove crucial in fighting the pandemic. But a number of risks and challenges must be addressed to realize the potential of this technology from privacy issues to practical hurdles. I wonder what kind of practical, hurd practical hurdles we've been running into lately um, that might pose some, some issues. Uh, and then there's a lot of data and, 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 and other associated information. I'm not going to go deep into a lot of this stuff. This is a report <clears throat> on the World Economic Forum website. And it ultimately will download this PDF 
And this PDF is a 28 page document that will break down a lot of eye-opening information that will really make you wonder and and ultimately bring a lot of this stuff together for you. And I'm I'm presenting a lot of this information because I read all of this stuff, which is why I make some of the comments that I make and why I have the outlook that I have because there are a lot of things that to me make much more sense than may make sense to other people who aren't necessarily paying as close attention to the world around them or what's going on. This, this is one of so many, and I'm not even showing what I consider to be some of the more, let's just say, interesting patents by Microsoft. <laughs> and this stuff is not, this isn't fake, folks. I hope you realize that. This is not BS. But this is basically a cryptocurrency system using body activity data. This doesn't look like a big deal, right? Um, but this is, of course, is a Microsoft uh, patent. And, um, you know, you could go into the related patent documents. Just punch in Internet of Bodies patents into like DuckDuckGo or something and take a look at what you find. And remember that in order for you to get a clear patent, you have to be able to demonstrate that the technology works for the most part. You have to have a way to show that this isn't just an idea, some frivolous idea that you want to lock up before anybody else has the means to ever even conceive of it. You have to show that the technology can work and, and provide uh, examples. Now, on this website, there's a link. This link will be on Soblox at some point, and it will show you the members list from inception of the World Economic Forum to present day. And the reason why I believe that is important is because in order for you to understand a great deal of what's going on in the world and why, you need to understand the overall message and the agenda associated with the groups like the World Economic Forum, what they're working towards, and how they're basically putting people in positions of power all over the world ultimately working in unison and how th that is how some of these, you know, people might think to themselves, oh, there's no way that all these people can work together and, and concoct this or establish that or achieve X, Y, Z. They can, and they are right now. And so when, when I read a lot of this stuff and, and, you know, sometimes I'm up super late at night, it's, you know, one in the morning and I'm, I'm just caught in a rabbit hole there is a lot of there are a lot of websites out there that are absolutely nuts okay there's a lot of conspiracy based websites out there that that love to compete for hits clicks and views and they dramatize a great deal of information and they use fear tactics and garbage to basically try and scare the hell out of you so that you keep reading you bookmark the website and you keep coming back for more it's the same principle i see on on lamestream news media each and every day they try to pull you in by fear by headlines that scare you and trigger you and then give you a bunch of information that's ultimately written in a way that that tells you how to think about the information they're presenting which to me is an absolute insult i don't need somebody to tell me what to think about something the same way you know if you take uh um politically leaning mediums on 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 the media you know you've got this group you've got both groups telling you the exact same thing but but they're both telling you how to think about it right so, so and they're polar opposites Nobody wants to let the general public think for themselves. And the problem is, is I consider that a long form indoct indoctrination into a particular narrative or a thought process. To me, it's insulting because I have my own brain cells and I'm capable of reading something and reading the details, the data, the facts associated with whatever the topic may be and formulating my own response. And if that response or that opinion doesn't necessarily coincide with the narrative you're trying to project, well, tough shit. But there are a lot of people who need to be led. There are a lot of people out there that need to be guided and led down a hallway of darkness. And their light is ultimately a skewed narrative um, that's ultimately there to create a perception of, of the way things are. And often 
it's not the case. It's not real. It's not true. It's minced words. It's twisted, twisted narratives, twisted stories. Everything is bullshit nowadays. But the question is why? And what is this ultimate, what I consider to be a semi, like a war on the populace on a global scale? What is the end goal? When the narratives established to institute a lot of these efforts have been proven time and time again to have holes and issues, why are they still held onto so tightly? What is the ultimate goal of these people on a grand scale? Is it really world peace? Is it a unification of resources for the betterment of mankind? Is it to uh, increase the power of, of, you know, not, not political power, but increase the power of the people to a degree that enables us to be more productive, more effective, basically working smarter, not harder, ultimately and allowing a, a, a much smaller number of people to accomplish the tasks, uh, the workloads, et cetera. Of, of of a much greater population that may or may not exist by the time a lot of this stuff really starts to rear its head that's that's my question and and you know you you when I think about how a lot of this stuff pertains to blockchain um these are the kinds of things that I consider I consider <coughs> centralized blockchains over decentralized pl blockchains what blockchains are likely <coughs> going to be utilized to facilitate a lot of this kind of technology and which are gonna be around to combat this. Well, as we've seen, centralized, excuse me, centralized cryptocurrencies, centralized blockchains, while easier to control, easier to establish a narrative for, easier to pump, easier to basically do whatever you want with, um, have have a lot of issues, and we're seeing a lot of that lately. Have have are we not? We're seeing what a centralized system, a centralized exchange with centralized tokens, um, the ease by which they're able to pump and manipulate the prices of these tokens to serve them directly, whoever them may be, whether it's the the owners of the exchanges, the board members, the investors, the venture capitalist groups everybody associated with it. And we're also able to see now just how easily that kind of stuff can go downhill to practically nothing overnight. But we, what we aren't seeing are similar things to that happening on more decentralized exchanges, decentralized blockchains. And so Charles said it himself, he's building Cardano to combat these centralized efforts of global elites that look to ultimately capitalize and control. Um, well, I could finish that line, but I don't think it'd be very fitting for this YouTube channel. Uh, I will, I will tell you that as always, my goal here is really to only ever open your eyes to the possibilities of what's out there to basically educate you as best I can and point you in directions that make you think for yourself while ultimately trying to avoid the narratives that are being pushed upon us. And, and you know, I've always believed in Cardano and I'm not necessarily 100% sold on any blockchain technology as it relates to the, the changes coming to the world, whether it be through internet of bodies, internet of things. From a speculative angle, I'm extremely bullish because as these technologies continue to establish themselves, the use cases for mass adoption, you know, at, at a recent panel, I said, uh, you know, I was, I spoke on the panel in, at Decentral in Miami and I, and every, and the question was about mass adoption. And I said, to some degree, to me, mass adoption isn't going to come willfully. In other words, Right now, the use cases we have to usher in any kind of mass adoption are all speculative in nature, not generally defined by an actual use case that benefits the world. We have trading, we have speculation, we have NFTs, um, we have gaming, we have fun things, um, or we have vice projects like online gambling and things like that, which is such a small niche. And when you talk about NFTs and we talk about these NFT markets and these NFT market caps, that's all based on, ultimately, in my opinion, it's based to a large degree on greed and speculation. 
but it is drawing in newcomers the same way ICOs did back in 2017 into 2018. And we still have a few popping up here and there. But what we're going to ultimately see is, you know, by me trying to study this and share some of this information, just to put ideas in your head, to literally put a perspective, a, a map, some bits of information that you can hopefully connect the dots to and say to yourself, okay, what is going to draw in mass adoption? Well, it's not likely going to be NFTs, but what it will likely be are internet of things, internet of bodies, and other protocols that are all working together to create a web of influence. That influence controlled or, or not, we'll have to wait and see. But I believe that that these products, like I just did this video on quant yesterday, and um, a lot of people seem to ignore it or they think it's paid because it was scripted. Well, it was scripted because I wanted to explain specifics on why I believe that quant is likely going to do very well in the future. And and quant's very fabric is it's an operating system to create interoperable protocols and applications on multiple blockchains blockchain simultaneously. And, and this token is ultimately what, what companies are paying big money for um, because they have to maintain ownership of these tokens to build on this, on this platform. And what we're seeing is the connectivity of between a multitude of centralized blockchains as well as decentralized blockchains. So there's going to be a use case for all of it to work together. And that was the whole point of that video. Um, and sometimes when I wanna make sure I'm very clear without rambling like I am right now, which some people love, some people don't, they tune it out. Sometimes I feel like my best nuggets come from just the rambling sessions before or after or during a particular video. but. Uh, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of demonstrate this on a on a on a on a scale that might basically show you not only is this stuff um, real and happening, but some of the biggest minds in blockchain uh, with the biggest connections, the the big. I mean, these Charles Hoskinson said it himself, and and when somebody like that says something that says that to you, you realize that this isn't just a bunch of crackpots on the internet talking a bunch of crazy stuff. There's a lot of that stuff out there, don't get me wrong, and you really have to read everything with kind of a grain of salt. But when the world economic themselves puts it all out there for you, uh, it, it's hard to ignore. And there's obviously a lot of, of speculation on what a lot of this stuff means, but I mean, let's be real, folks. This, this stuff is right in front of us and we can either choose to ignore it or we can choose to figure out how to better prepare and align, and align ourselves so that we're not effective so much in a negative way, um, but we, 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 are, we are actually able to benefit from it somehow as we continue to learn and this technology continues to come to fruition. So hopefully I didn't ramble too much into 20 different directions and I was able to complete a clear thought that may help you moving forward in the future. Hopefully I didn't say or do anything that's gonna get me censored. I, I, I don't think I have because a lot of this stuff is all public knowledge. It's not anything new. It's just basically showing you guys and gals <coughs> what's out there, what's happening, and what I think is likely to come. So until next time, guys, crow your coins, and I hopefully will see you again soon.